All right. Happy Wednesday. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm super excited today because we have both Alan and Brooke here from Eureka, Eureka Process. Um, Alan is the founder and Brooke is their VP. And I'm super excited to talk to you guys today um, about finding the ideal client with or candidate with your V screening. Um, love to hear about that. Um, but I would love for you guys to just dive in and kind of just tell um, our viewers and listeners that we have live today kind of who you guys are and what you are about. Sure. Can we switch to the uh, screen share? Absolutely. Let me bring that up there. Awesome. So, uh, yeah, so we are going to talk about finding the ideal candidate. Um, and so I, I think that merits why the heck can we talk about that? Right. Uh, uh, so I've been in IT since 94. I've owned an MSP business. I've sold my MSP business and I've ran two other MSP businesses. Uh, and now we are a vendor to MSPs. Uh, we we offer two services, uh, and uh, besides coaching with process and leadership, uh, we have found a huge demand for simply screening candidates because we have a process for that, and it's quite complex. And we're going to share that today, our process, so you can do it yourself. Uh, but so many people come back to us like, "Yeah, I love your process. Don't have the time. Can you do it for us?" And and Brooke's been primarily responsible. Uh, for doing that for us. And Brooke, I'll let you introduce yourself as well. Uh, my name is Brooke Lee. Uh, I've been in IT since 96, 97. Uh, I've been in MSP since uh, 2011. Um, I've known Alan for probably seven or eight years at this point, maybe. Um, we worked at the same MSP together um, and he left and then started this business Eureka process. And then I came to join him about two years ago. Uh, the V screening process uh, <clears throat> or service that we have, it, it's not where, not what we started out with, but we saw a need for it. And part of what we do at Eureka process is we, we like to help people as corny as that sounds. Um, <laughs> all people were really struggling with this and it was something that we knew how to do and we felt it was in our wheelhouse. So it, again, it was just a way for us to help um, our clients. Uh, what's fun is when Brooke and I were, were first working together, we went through a, a, a massive period of growth in our service department. We went from 12 people to 24 people. Oh, wow. Uh, How, like uh, what time span did that happen? Uh, I mean, that growth was over four years, but most of it was in a, in a more compressed period of time. Uh, and in the end, we Brooke and I were so busy because she was a, a dispatcher at the time. I was like, hey, can you review these resumes for me? Because um, there's <laughs> too many. Uh, and we ended up... Uh, adding some automations and workflows and connect wise and creating a process where Brooke knew which boxes to look for. Uh, and we, we, we streamlined it. And at the end of one year, we had gone through 5,000 resumes, probably hired 10 people, probably kept about eight of them at the time. Okay. Uh, and a lot of that uh, early practice that she and I did develop the process into what it is today. And that's what we're going to share is that process that we came up with to help quickly screen for quality candidates. Uh, to share one stat, uh, for those who utilize our services, we are uh, promising uh, a interview to hire ratio of 50% or more, meaning on average, the person we send you is the person we're gonna hire. Uh, wow. It's not okay. a recruiting service where we're like, hey, try this, try this guy, try this guy, how right. about this guy? Uh, it works completely different. It's like, here's a guy you should hire. Do your final interview. And that's all you have to do. Fantastic. So you guys do a lot of the like foreground work and a lot of the, you know, on the ground finding out like if they're actually going to be a good fit. You know, a lot of the time consuming piece, it sounds like. Uh, absolutely. It is all about time savings. People want to uh, compare us to recruiters. And while we're doing the recruitment piece as well as, as a necessary evil, it, it's not our unique ability. It's not what saves you time. It's the screening, the having to interview, test. Uh, we, we simplify that and hand you a complete package at the end. Uh, the good news is for those do-it-yourselfers, we're going to share that whole process right now. Uh, what it looks like. Uh, glad for you to take this and do it. We definitely have people who have successfully implemented this process and they enjoy the screening and hiring process. Great here's how you can streamline that. So a quick question for you, Alan, um, when you're looking at the screening process, 
Um, what is the most typical candidate that you're looking for? Is it a tech? Is it sales? Um, what kind of ground do you guys cover there? Uh, it's, uh, I'll let Brooke answer in more detail. It's definitely in the service delivery department. Uh, we have not been asked to look for finance, sales, or even marketing yet. Okay. Um, but even inside of service delivery, there's obviously several different types of positions. Brooke, do we have a clear front runner? Uh, it, right now, it's mostly service department. It's various levels of techs. Um, I've got probably, I think, seven different people I'm working with right now. I've got from tier ones up to, I call the tier three buck stops here people. Um, we fill dispatcher roles, service coordinator roles. Um, mm -hmm like I said, entry level, um, all the way up to, like I said, the, the big boy tier three people. Uh, I will add from a recruitment standpoint, the probably the most difficult position we're looking for these days yeah. uh, is field tech or on-site tech. Okay. <laughs> uh, I, I'm sure COVID fears have a lot to do with it. Safety. Uh, also uh, a, the comfort and acceptance of being able to work from home yeah. uh, and not having to travel anymore. Uh, so Brooke's been working with a lot of our clients to change up job descriptions, really push benefits and, and the, uh, the benefits of working for this uh, your company uh, to get more candidates. But that has been harder to fill. Definitely, definitely. And we see that all the time in the IT MSP business owners group and, you know, with a lot of the MSPs that, you know, we work with here at Seven Figure MSP, too. Mm hmm. All right, let's let's dive into the process. Yeah, we'd love to see this. Uh, for those watching, feel free to ask a question at any time. Um, Lisa's volunteered to interrupt us at a good time. <laughs> uh, we could go on forever. Uh, we cannot get through every detail of this process in the time allotted today, and that's by nature. <laughs> I talk fast. Brooke talks faster. Uh, so also glad for slow down feedback, uh, and I don't mind expanding an area that you're interested in. Uh, sure. And it, it, even if we don't get through all the content, that's fine. I'd rather talk about what you guys are interested in. Fantastic. Well, let's all right, we'll start at the beginning. We have to let people know you're hiring. Ah. Uh, I, I don't like this part, but it's all we have to do. This should be based on a job description. Uh, I've seen tons of topics at, uh, at the uh, IT and MSP uh, business owners group about, hey, what job description do you have? It's a great starting point. Uh, just keep uh, a very fine line, and Brooke has some some feedback about this. Uh, in your job description, there are things that you would like to have, and there are things that you have to have, and you need to be crystal clear. The more have-to-haves you have, either the more you're going to pay or the less likely you are to actually find that candidate. Uh, especially in the lower tiers, aptitude, I feel, is so much more important than experience and skills. Uh, keep that in mind. I mean, a lot of times for a tier two tech, we want, you know, a network expert and a server expert. Sure. But really, typically you get one of those, right? And you, <laughs> then you have somebody who can figure stuff out in the other half of the equation. It also reduces the people you're going to get in the pipeline <clears throat> um, as well. So if the more things that you are putting down that we absolutely have to have this, um, I mean, not everybody, but a lot of people are not going to apply. Um, you know, you've got 12 things on your list. They have maybe eight and they're like, man, there's, then they have to have these other, you know, three or four things. I don't yeah. really need those. So I'm not going to apply. So you want to be really careful about what you have to have versus what are, I would like to have this in a person. And you guys help the MSPs kind of distinguish, right? So if they come to you with like a laundry list of things like the, and I always, you know, the want versus the need, right? <laughs> that is part of the process. When somebody wants us to do V screening, uh, they agree to do the, v the one of the very first pieces is I sit down with them. We do an interview for an hour. Um, I'm asking you very specific questions. Um, what is it you have to have and what is it do you want to have? And then we talk about that and then I will write the job description and I will send it to you and we will kind of go back and forth on that. And again, I'm, I'm really cautious, you know, virtualization. Do you have to have VMware or do you just need somebody that knows virtualization in general? Uh, so if they have some Hyper-V, uh, same thing maybe with firewalls, you know, you're a SOFO shop. Okay, great. Do they have to have SOFO's experience or do we just need somebody who has some pretty major heavy lifting on firewalls in general? Uh, and so let's try, that's why I try to help them figure out the, the, the medium middle point. Uh, one side benefit of, of doing what we've been doing lately is we get higher volume uh, in the various tools and platforms we use to advertise the job position. 
Um, in those cases, uh, our vendors now will actually come back to us. And it's happened once or twice. We're like, hey, uh, Brooke, this one position seems a little out of whack for you guys. Do you realize that the industry actually calls for this salary or that this word doesn't match up with your description from the title? Uh, I think we've, uh, maybe how often does that happen? Brooke, once or twice now? Uh, since we started it, I think one time. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but it, it's great that we know we, our vendors are also helping look out for our clients and going, okay, we need to tweak this because it's not lining up with, with the norms to actually get qualified candidates. Uh, yeah, so but, we had a great question come in on that tech side. What's the average time to fill a, a level two, level three system engineer for on site? Uh, one, I think there's a big difference in level two and level three. Uh, yeah. you, like, uh, you want to give your, your general experiences? Um, level two, uh, if you, if the person is going to have to be on site all the time, that means I have to find someone in a specific location. So, you know, you're in Austin, Texas, you need a tier two, Austin, Texas has to live there, um, has to go on site. That's going to reduce the candidate pool. Anytime you have these factors that funnel down, it's going to take you longer to find somebody. Um, <clears throat> if you're looking for a remote position, it is a heck of a lot easier to find somebody because I've opened up my candidate pool from coast to coast. Uh, tier twos, level twos, uh, they're going to be easier to find because, you know, I, I don't need as much experience. I need some experience, but not much. I would say uh, on average, we're probably four weeks ballpark. Um, tier threes take longer again. And there's so many mitigating factors. So that's why I hate to put a time limit on this. It depends on your market. I mean, if your unemployment is really, really low, that means not a lot of people are looking for a job. So it's going to take longer. If you have really high unemployment, then I'm going to have a really good shot of getting somebody in one to two weeks. Um, so it depends on the market that you're in. Uh, it also depends on the salary that you're willing to pay. If your salary that, and again, part of it is your budget. So, I mean, if you only have X amount of dollars to pay, I've got to work within that budget. But if your budget is lower, that's going to reduce the candidate pool. So that means we got to kind of think outside the box how to go get people. Um, so there's so many factors that play into that. And any of any one of those multitude of those are going to cause that time factor to, to shift. Um, but I'd say on average, all things being equal, four-ish weeks for a tier two. And I'd say probably six plus for a tier three. Fantastic. Uh, uh, not that I've studied the data enough, but I also have a, this, this thought process that it tends to happen in four weeks or less. <laughs> but then if it doesn't, it tends to take quite a while, is what I found. If we haven't found a candidate in the first four weeks, it's, it gets a little lengthier uh, to get that candidate on board. And I'll emphasize what Brooke said about the market. Who knew the world's toughest job market is? Miami, Florida. I never <laughs> would have guessed. Uh, New York City is actually number two. That I would have guessed. Yeah. Okay. That's interesting, you know, because you think that it's like so populated and there's a lot of people in a small area that it would be easier to find a qualified it, person. That market is super tight down there. And because it's so tight and the candidate pool is so small, uh, they can command extremely high salaries down there. I mean, like a tier two down there, you're probably, I mean, that guy right now, to get a solid tier two, you're probably looking at a hundred grand. They, like yeah. I said, the market is really tight and those guys can command and they know it. They can command really large salaries because they know there's not a lot of them available. And even the job ads are cost more in those markets to run than other areas. The budget is, is, is higher. Yeah, definitely. So definitely. speaking of which, the second part of getting the word out is a marketing statement because it really is not a job post. It is a job ad. You are advertising and nobody really wants a job. What they want is I, is an income combined with a place of belonging, right? They're, they're joining a team. They might prefer to go to the Seahawks versus the Buccaneers. I don't know. There's something about <laughs> the team dynamic. Uh, and, and we have a little more on this, but don't forget that you are marketing yourself and you have to have this as a part of getting the word out and that it is an ad. So you, you have to sell them on, on what is needed and help filter it from there and place the job ad. Okay. So uh, I'll, I'll keep this fairly high level because I hate this part. Uh, <laughs> necessary evil. Necessary evil. Uh, don't forget to give uh, multiple points of view in the job description. You need general, contextual. Um, I even like to write a day in the life if I have room. Like, I hey, you come in, you do this, you do this. Uh, sometimes we get to go do this. Show them what it's like because you want yeah. to – while you have to sell this in a positive way, 
you want to set realistic expectations. You don't want to convince somebody to come work for you and then they're disappointed in what in versus their expectations. Absolutely. Uh, I'd rather take longer to hire than have a what we call a boom, boomerang. Uh, yeah. hire them and they're gone. <laughs> well, I like that analogy, a boomerang. Okay. Yeah. And uh, we've already mentioned the difference in requirements versus would like to have, but there's also a, a, a difference that we have to think through on experience versus skills. Yeah. Um, you know, time on the job can be a good thing, a great thing, better than skills sometimes or better than documentable skills. Sure. Uh, uh, at the same time, Brooke will tell you sometimes experience on the job can be a bad thing. Like you've worked in corporate IT for 20 years. Right. How do you handle the MSP world? Uh, rarely does that work out. I've never taken somebody from corporate and put it in put them in an MSP space. Uh, it's just, especially in again, you work somewhere for 10 to 15 years. Okay, that's great. And it shows longevity and loyalty to a company. However, in the MSP space, it's going to be really hard for you to work here because, you know, you worked on one network, maybe you built it, didn't break, you just sat around making coffee. Now you're working at MSP, you got 50 networks. Yeah, we have a stack, but everybody's a little bit different when they first come in. You got to learn all the different networks. You have to manage the different networks, different line of business apps. Uh, not to mention um, MSPs, we have time tracking. It's how we get paid. It's how we keep the lights on. Uh, corporate people are not... Always, and again, this is a general statement, are not used to tracking time uh, documentation of what they've done in that manner. And that is a large ship to turn, and I have yet to be able to turn it. I have yet to find somebody who's been in corporate for a, a very long period of time and ended up wrecking, recommending them to an MSB. It just it doesn't happen. Now, now, you get somebody two years in corporate who is just aching for a challenge. That there we have some hope. Could be a fit there. Okay, that's interesting. So I feel like that fits a lot into the mindset and maybe the day to day dynamic that MSPs have versus like corporate IT, like you were saying. Um, and that's something where, you know, we talk a lot about on our end, like doing disk assessments with not only your existing team, but also people who are coming into the mix as well. Um, do you guys do that on your end as well? Go ahead. <laughs> Uh, it, it is not a disk assessment per se, even though we love those as well as some others like Color Code, um, Myers Briggs, and such. Um, what we do instead is it is a personality profile. Uh, so instead of assigning a, a, a standard letter grade style, uh, okay. it describes to us uh, four general categories, uh, four detailed category cues uh, each of what their personality is like. We rarely put a pass fail on that but instead we help tailor our interview to look for potential challenges in the job they're going to perform. So if they are strict rule followers, right? I kind of like that for help desk, but I have some concerns when you get to the tier three. All right. I want somebody who can think outside the box and, and try a few things. And so it doesn't mean we're not going to hire them. It means we're going to ask them questions during their interview about their working style uh, in that regards. No, I, I like that. And I think that's, you know, really important in understanding not only how you yourself as a person works, but how you interchange on a daily basis with other people who have different personalities or styles of doing work um, mm -hmm. based on where they've been before, right? Man, there's every now and then we have somebody where we, we, we discover a line of questioning uh, due to the personality profile and we determine it's not going to be a fit. Right. Uh, but, it's, but it's not the test itself. It's their responses to the questions the test causes us to ask. Fantastic. Awesome. All right. So I'll keep this brief and simple. Uh, you have to sell your company and your job ad. Uh, the example here is ours. Keep in mind, I don't hire very often. Uh, <laughs> so I haven't had a chance to revise ours over and over again. So there's Fair. nothing really cool about the sample we have up on the screen. Uh, but the sample is, this is the cool stuff we're doing. These are our core values. We want somebody who wants to enjoy that. Uh, I know when we were, I was doing, uh, uh, looking for a tier three, which was taking forever in a market, in a, in a very small market, people love our town. And we had decided to start allowing people to relocate to our town for the job. So we sold the town. Like, hey, Savannah, Georgia, beautiful. We have marshes, we have islands, we have water sports. Uh, I mean, so we, we sold the town as a part of our ad. 
That's really, that's a really kind of neat way to spin it, you know, noticing that, right? Some people, I mean, if you're getting them to come to a physical office, I'm assuming, right? To like move there for that. Some clients, yes, we have them. They are looking for people to specifically come to the office. Uh, this is actually my favorite part of writing the job description because as a candidate, this person could be looking at hundreds of job ads per day. That first paragraph, that's the best thing I got to try to get somebody to stop, look, and see what's going on. So I try to be clever and not be too corny. Um, but this is why I do the interview with the owner. Uh, I've got a client. Um, they have a pool table uh, in their space. Uh, they just recently renovated. And they have a beer keg. Yes. So my opening line is like, like pool, like beer. Uh, whoever is late, by the way, at that company, if you're going to be late to work, you have to bring donuts. So my thing was like, you know, you like beer donuts and pool, this may be your stop. And then, you know, little clever things like that. You wouldn't, I mean, they were like, you really want to put that? And I was like, absolutely. I'm putting that in the ad. Whatever I can do to get somebody to just stop for a second and think, what is this? This sounds whatever. Let me take a look. Um, and so I've done several like that. I've got a, a client, uh, their name is sort of superhero-ish. So I said, hey, if you know, if you've got the superhero IT skills, I'll provide the cake. What do you got for me? So it's just trying to think of little catchy things like that to get somebody to pause and read your ad and see if, you know, they're thinking, man, this looks like a cool place to work. Let me put, you know, let me put my resume in for this one. So it's that fine line between catchy and kitschy. <laughs> I love that. So now that we, you know, with COVID and, you know, everybody kind of had this big shift, right, to go work from home. Uh -huh. Now I can, you know, how has that changed in that kind of description for you to kind of get people, you know, yes, there are people that want to work from home, but how do you get that to appeal to other people where it's like, you know, we're not all going to be in an office together. We're not going to see each other in person every day. Um, you know, but there is something to be said about a completely remote workforce when it's done right. Right. <laughs> I, I actually see the exact opposite, Lisa. We're having to sell our clients on hiring remote. Uh, a, a lot of owners are still like, nope, I really want them in the office. Uh, many states are now allowing people to work in the office with, with social distancing measures. Uh, and, and they're and we were having some mental health issues. I'm not talking like crisis by any means, but we're having people who aren't performing as good remotely mm -hmm. uh, or uh, even if they're performing well, they're reporting that they're less happy at work. They're missing the camaraderie. Where's the teamwork? I'm like, well, you're not reaching out via Slack or Teams or, or calling videos. So we're finding a lot of people prioritizing getting people in the office working together again. That's nice, actually nice to hear, you know, <laughs> it's good to hear that people want to go back in to the office. Um, you know, we've seen that here in Phoenix, Arizona, you know, people, the offices are starting to fill back up more and more capacity. So, I mean, that's interesting. I just was interested to see how that has kind of changed if, you know, on the MSP's end. Uh, yeah. And I, and I think we spend a good bit of time trying to convince business owners to hire remote workers, both remote in city so they can participate in things and remote distance. And that was been actually a harder sell than I imagined for IT firms. Uh, it, some of it is because some of the firms that we work with, their their clients are there locally in the same city with them. So they do on-site visits. Um, I've got one client that they only have remote workers, but they don't do any on-sites. Everything is remote support. So therefore, you know, that guy doesn't care where this person works. Um, but the ones that, like I said, they support local businesses more than others. They want somebody there in the office. And all of the people that I work with, they've made um, adjustments in the office to be able to allow for the spacing of the desks. You know, things have moved apart. Um, you know, they're taking the temperatures when they come in every single day, things like that. So, you know, the, the companies that we work with have made uh, significant, uh, I don't know what word I'm looking for, uh, accommodations to make sure that if you want to come into the office, that we will make it safe for you to be able to work here. All right. Let's, All right, let's, let's finish go. off where to advertise jobs at. This is a pretty clinical exercise here. Uh, you bring in all those things together, your job description, your requirements, your marketing statement. Uh, people will fight me. Feel free to do so in the comments and ask questions. But we strongly believe in advertising pay. Mm -hmm. There are people who are diametrically opposed to this, and I get it. Uh, but this is a type of filter. I don't want to talk to somebody who wants twice what I can pay. 
Mm -hmm. I don't want to talk to somebody who wants half of what I can pay. There is no such thing as a, as a, as a white knight that you're going to magically pay half for and get what you need. Right. Uh, you can give a wide range. That's okay. But please give us a range to work with to advertise for. This is a okay. very important filter for everybody's time. Don't forget call to action. Most job platforms, this part's super easy. It's built in. Uh, but if not, don't forget to tell them how to submit what is it a resume is it a form to fill out uh give me instructions i need On the first... call to action i have a question for you versus yep. people that just put an email address like send your resume to sales at versus people who have it where they fill out the application online do you guys see a difference in the response to each of those. Uh, you will see more about our process around that shortly. However, if we can make it easy for you, the screener, to screen resumes more quickly, I say put as few entries, sorry, as few barriers to entries as possible to get their application. Um, while you would like them to really want to work for you and have sought you out, the fact is if somebody's looking for a job, they owe it to their family, to their to their bill collectors to go out and get a job. So they, they are going to apply for as many as possible. And I get that. Um, and so our job is just to screen as effectively as possible. So we make it easy and you're going to see why we recommend just having them email a resume. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yeah, no, great. I'm glad you went over that. All right. We're going to post. Uh, first of all, don't forget your existing staff. They know people, they have friends. It's the greatest compliment anybody can pay to say, you know what? I love where I work. I wish you could work for us too. Uh, so create some sort of program in writing, reward your employees for making those recommendations or hires. Uh, sure, maybe 10 to 15% of all of those work out, but that's 10 to 15% you didn't have before and it makes two people happy. Absolutely. Uh, LinkedIn is a place uh, we do not advertise here first. Um, uh, we use it as a backup plan. We are finding not a lot of difference in the quality of candidate, which even though I expected that, but we are also finding a higher dollars per applicant, dollars per successful applicant. Okay. Uh, so we, we tend to save LinkedIn for after that initial four weeks. If we haven't found somebody, okay, let's expand uh, to LinkedIn. Our primaries are using Indeed and ZipRecruiter. Uh, I don't know all the details. Uh, fortunately, Brooke and Veronica handle that for us. Okay. Uh, for ZipRecruiter, we actually have a recruiting account and we pay a monthly fee that gives us more access to post things. Uh, and Indeed and LinkedIn, we just get bulk discounts for doing that. Oh, very good, okay. Uh, Facebook is an option. It's not more fav my favorite. You can post it organically. People will see your job ad if they go to your go to or follow your your site but paid uh facebook is also an option uh we always take advantage of all the organic stuff because it's free it's easy to copy and paste our information over uh and then from time to time we will turn on paid facebook again if other things aren't working we need some more candidates we like to try new things hey craigslist <laughs> it's still weird Expecting that at all. <laughs> uh, we do not lead with Craigslist again. It's not sure. expensive, but we tend to wait for the first four weeks. And if we get it filled, great. Or if we have a huge pipeline, great. But for depending on your market, 25 to 45 bucks, you get a 30 day ad. We tend to get another 10, 20 resumes that way. And, and so some, sometimes some good ones. So we like to keep trying different things because every market is different. Yeah. Craigslist is not dead. Oh, <laughs> I thought it was. <laughs> I, I thought so too at first, but then we tried it when we had some positions that weren't getting filled, like, you know, after seven, eight weeks, like, okay, let's, let's try it. That's, that's crazy, but that's awesome. <laughs> I would have never thought of that. Uh, and I'm sure there are plenty more. Uh, just, yeah, I was going to say, we get that question a lot in the IT and MSP business owners group. Like, is it better to do Indeed or ZipRecruiter? Or there's like, you know, <clears throat> a lot of other ones out and, there. And we have not vetted or tried them all. I'm a firm believer that if you take 100 choices, you've just multiplied the amount of time you've uh, <laughs> stopped to get started by 100. Uh, so create your requirements, find the ones that match it, and then occasionally experiment, which is why we have the list that we have. I would also say advertise on your company's website. Oh, I did not list that. Thank you for reminding me. 
if you have a, a website and you can throw that up there, I would definitely put it on the company website. All of the ones that we do for our clients, we advertise on Eureka Process's website and all of our social media as well. Um, so we do Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, uh, Twitter. Uh, we post all of those jobs on all of those social media platforms. Um, and another thing, if you're going to do this yourself, uh, this is mainly if you've, if you've got a city where you're looking for somebody locally, uh, don't forget the job fairs. They are, yes, they are time consuming for you to go do those, but it gives you some community, what I call community street cred. Uh, usually the people, the businesses that, is, that, that participate in those, the city looks favorably upon you. It looks like you're participating in the community. You want to hire from people from within the community. So if you have somebody that, you know, can maybe invest that time, it's it's a good community outreach tool. And most IT firms are, are, are at least our, our uh, process coaching clients, they're doing well. They're all hiring right now. Yeah. Uh, some of them are hiring multiples. Uh, and, and every time they fill one, there's there's more to hire. Yeah. Uh, so and there's value in going to a, a job fair, even if you don't find someone that month. Uh, sure. There's value in being seen, being known as an employer in your community. And the reason I'm saying it is because we did it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we did the job fair scene when we were looking through those 5,000 resumes. Uh, I probably went to four or five that year. Uh, oh. Yeah. Just, I mean, I think we got one person from them, but again, it's always nice to get out into the community. It's also an opportunity for me to tell people about what our MSP did, who the company is, all about us, because you never know who else might be at that job there. Could be a potential client there. You never know. Yeah, you never know. And and so this, I see this question a lot in our uh, Facebook group as well, but we have a lot of MSPs that are growing, right? Which is great to see. And they're starting to expand, um, you know, co-location now, right? We're going to have an uh, office in Los Angeles and we're going to have an office in Miami, Florida now. Mm -hmm. right? So they might not have the opportunity to necessarily go to a job fair because that's not their necessarily local market to where they're located. How would you guys recommend them kind of finding people in that area that they're new to? Uh, I would say use the platforms. I have a client now that's looking for one person, but I'm advertising it in two separate locations at the same time. Uh, so I just, you know, single posting, but I've got it running in multiple cities at the same time. So I would get it up and running, like I said, on whatever platforms you want to use. Um, mm -hmm. Also reach out to uh, the local uh, unemployment offices. Um, we have one here in the town that we live in, and you can almost always reach out to somebody there and they'll put it on their website for literally no charge. It's free as long as you have a business that's, you know, uh, incorporated in that city um, and they'll put it on their website. So when people are looking for, for jobs, especially with COVID, there was, you know, all the heavy layoffs. Um, yeah. So that's another place where you can do something locally uh, in, in a new town that you're in. And again, it's, it gets community buy-in, you know, they they know that you're new there and you're looking for people. And anytime you can, like I said, strengthen community ties, I think that helps. Uh, I'll reiterate, if you're in a new market, even if it's minimally staffed, um, for your second market, find ways to get involved in the community, chamber of commerce, job fairs, even if you have to ask a technician to show up with a shirt on, um, or hopefully have a salesperson in the local market. Uh, it's a team of, it's a team sport. Be seen. Love that. That's great advice. Love that. Um, all right. Drum roll, please. Our whole screening process is right here for you. You ready? Ready. That's it. That's all you have to do. <laughs> all right. Uh, seriously, we're going to explain this and we're going to drill in because I'm also over 40 and I can't read this. <laughs> I was like, it's a little bit small, but yeah, I would love for you to like hone in and go through it because yep. I mean, this, this looks awesome from a map. That's what we're going to do. Uh, remember every process can, can be, um, every process can be tweaked to your, to your own. In fact, we've changed this process a little bit internally than what's on your screen because we're now screening so many people for, for multiple other clients. We, we've flipped a few things on its end, but the steps are still the same. Uh, sure. And if you would like to experience this process, send us a test message to opportunities at EurekaProcess.com. Uh, Lisa, if you could drop that into the chat yeah. for everybody, uh, yeah. that would be great. Uh, we have done some automation uh, in our ticketing system, which is ConnectWise Manage. Uh, we, it could be done in auto task I've seen, but they have a shared uh, 
status list, so it gets a little junky sometimes. I'm sure other PSAs could do it too. But we have some automation, and whether you use automation in your ticketing system or some other system or not, uh, we have information that we deliver, words that we say at each step of the progress. By participating in this test, uh, even if you watch the recording, uh, we can walk you through the process. You can get those words, those, those email templates and use those for yourself. yourself. So Brooke is going to be monitoring a service board through this and walking people through as if they're an applicant. Okay. All right? so opportunities at eurekaprocess.com. So the first thing that happens, uh, and we actually have this a little differently in our already, but your ticket ends up in a, uh, is, is a new ticket and we let you know, hey, we got your application, plain and simple. Okay. Uh, look for words from us next. Uh, then we review the resume. And I and remember that, uh, my slides aren't great. Remember that uh, time is of the essence. You too might be scanning 5,000 resumes in a year. Do not do a deep dive on resumes. Do they have the general experience I'm looking for? Oh, they worked at an IT company last year? Good enough. Oh, they've only ever worked at McDonald's and this is a tier three position. Not good enough. You pass. <laughs> keep it simple. Keep it quick. Uh, Brooke, your, what's your average time to review a resume? 30 seconds. 30 Ooh. seconds. And that includes updating the ticket in our case. Uh, we have a special status called no position open. Which means, hey, there's nothing about this interview, this resume that has offended us that we would never hire you, but you don't fit the qualifications for this job. And keep in mind, maybe you're looking for a receptionist next year. I like to keep resumes on file. Yeah. Uh, I'll go ahead and jump to this conclusion, even though it almost never happens in the resume phase. We also have a no position, a no fit that's our code word for you don't fit our culture. Sometimes you have done something offensive during the process. It happens. Ooh. Like we turn you down and keep your resume and you go, oh, F you. Uh, I didn't want to work for you anyways. Okay, well, we just moved you from maybe later to <laughs> never. Sometimes you get, you'll get you get people that will apply for a position and they're underqualified. It's not that they're not an IT person, but maybe he's, maybe he's just a tier one and he's applied for this senior role that I have open. This person is not a good fit for that, but I want to put a note in there and I want to change the status. So if they need a tier one, maybe, you know, three months they've grown, they got a couple new clients and they're like, hey, Brooke, do you have any tier one people? I can go back and, and dig through that pile of resumes and find that guy that he wasn't a good fit for the tier three, but he's legit good to go for my tier one spot. Yeah, that's fantastic. And then you do get the crazy ones from time to time. We don't get them often, but they are out there. <laughs> and how long do you, would you guys keep that on file for? In our connect wise, it's forever. <laughs> Okay, so, you know, it's, it's forever. Um, it stays out there. But generally, if if I've uh, saved something in that particular status, and sometimes I even get to the interview portion, and when I interview, I realize this person's not going to be a good fit, and I will let them know, hey, I don't think you're a good fit for this role, but I want to keep your stuff on file. And I've actually there is a, a client that I have in the Midwest. I talked to a kid. He did not have the qualifications. Super nice. Did great on my. I had attitude, aptitude. I was looking for. And like two months later, the owner was like, hey, Brooke. And I was like, hold up. I got a guy. Let me go track him down. <laughs> so I went and got him. And I was like, hey, he's got this job open. Here's the description. Let me know. And he was like, absolutely. And he's been hired and he's been promoted. And he's been there like five months. So it's, you know, wow. you just got to think kind of, is this person, is this, a, is this a good girl, a good guy? I want to save them. They don't fit this, but I want to save them for later. And I'm honest with people. And people think that it's that whole, you're kind of blowing smoke when I say I'm going to call you back. But we do, and I've done it several times now. I mean, sure, ninety percent of them don't get callbacks, but right. those who made it uh, allowed it to happen, mm -hmm. opportunities occur. Yeah, all the time, all the time. All right, so we reviewed resumes in thirty seconds or less for each one. Oh, we have a question that came in real fast, Alan. Um, if you use Indeed, do you still ask the candidate to send resume to your uh, ConnectWise board? Uh, absolutely. And I believe we have Indeed send it for us. We do. It's a default. So it's not a default setting. It is a setting on Indeed where I can say when the person applies, I need the resume. So the resume comes in attached with that email that they've sent in. So, I mean, there are certainly some complications with each platform. Uh, 
and some of them we've chosen to deal with the complications. Other platforms, we said, you know what? Our process saves us time. I can't break the process just because some platform makes promises. And uh, for the test, you should have just received an email from us saying that we got your application. Uh, so congratulations, you uh, <laughs> we have your application. A and we've reviewed your resume. We have found it not wanting, but quality resume. So we're putting you on to the next step. Now, I can never remember which slide is the next step, we'll, but it's showing on this slide. Next, we send the email interview. One of my favorite parts. Uh, for the email interview, and uh, slides over. I thought I had some responses here. Yeah. Our email interview. We ask three questions. You certainly have alternatives, but we'll do one question at a time and let Brooke explain why. Why we ask the question and how we evaluate the answer. Go ahead, Brooke. Uh, first one, and I will caveat this entire thing. These are three questions that Alan and I developed when we were going through the 5,000 Mirth May. So these are not just something we decided to pull out or whatever. <laughs> um, what do you know about our company? This is a simple question. I want to know, can you Google? Do you care enough to go look up the company's website and tell me, do you know anything about this company? Hey, I'm applying at Severn Figure MSP. I know that Lisa is the marketing person there and Chris is the owner. You just want to know, does this person care enough to go do a little research on their own about the place they're applying to? Oh, sure. um, so that is the reason we ask that question. I will get people that will say, I don't even know what company I'm applying for. Um, again, it's not a deal breaker, but it lets me know that you're not really that interested in pursuing the, the, the role that we have open here. Yeah. Second question. Uh, second question, what makes you a better fit for our company than other candidates? Uh, I've got a couple comments from candidates that I've interviewed that this is a loaded question. Uh, I am not asking you to tell me that you're the best thing since sliced bread. I am asking you to answer this question so I can figure out what kind of person you are. Um, yeah. If you come back and answer this question and tell me you are the best thing since sliced bread and you're an expert in everything IT under the sun and there's no one better than you, we are going to have a serious problem. You have some ego issues that we are probably not going to be able to get past because we all know in the MSP space, we do everything. Nobody's an expert in everything. Uh, tell me what your real, the, my favorite answers are the ones where the people say, I don't really know who else is applied, but let me tell you about myself. I'm really, really good at servers. I'm kind of light on the networking. Uh, people that are willing to open up faults out of the gate, I always think extremely highly of because nobody's an expert in everything. I don't care what you say on your resume. You know that there's things that you really know you know, and there's other things where, yeah, I can figure it out, but this is definitely not my my strong suit. And I want to be honest and upfront about that. So that's why we asked that question to kind of get an idea of who that person is. Great. Uh Third question, can they break down simple concepts we take for granted into clear steps? My, our question is, tell me how you buckle a seatbelt and why you would do it. The reason that we use this question is because in IT, um, we take things that we do every single day for granted. We do them every single day, day in and day out. It is like, we don't even have to think about it. We do it so often. So reset the password in AD, for example. Everybody right. knows how to do it. But if I need to explain to someone else how to do something, I need somebody that has the ability to break something down that seems so easy to me into terminology and steps to a person, especially if I'm getting them to help me troubleshoot something. I need somebody to check a cable on the back, see if a light is on on the network card. How can I describe that to someone who's not technical in a way that doesn't come across as condescending so you don't come across as being a jerk? Um, how can I explain this to somebody in really good terminology? Second part of the question is, why should you do it? A lot of people forget to answer that part. To me, that lets me know that you're not paying attention to the details. You did not read the entire question. That can cause you a whole bunch of heartburn in IT. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've got this SOP. It is six steps for me to get from point A to point B. And I got all the way to step four. And I was like, yep, I'm good. And took off running. And guess what? Number five and number six are so important. And because you didn't do that, the client is now down. So reading the entire question, thoughtfully answering the question, I have some people that have fun with it. They'll kind of get crazy with the thing and say, hey, let me tell you about this time. You know, I was on this uh, spaceship and I had to put the seatbelt on. Some people get really creative with it. If you do that or if somebody's just very black and white to the point, again, as long as you answer the question and both parts of the question, that is the, it's less of 
important to me, whether you're having fun with it or not, it's just the fact that you took the time to answer it in a clear manner and you answered both parts of the question. So Brooke, how often does somebody fail this part? If you had to make a guess, how do we filter at this stage? A quarter, 25%. So about a quarter, we, we rule out at this point, they can't write or they won't write or they show some serious attitude problems. Yeah, or they are just a jerk. <laughs> Or they're okay. <laughs> one of my one of my job descriptions it says on there you know we're looking for good guys and gals jerks need not apply uh msp space is it's very different it is so teamwork oriented because again i may be really good at servers alan's great at firewalls i've got to work with him i am stuck we have to work together and you know figure this thing out you don't have time for people that want to sit on a pedestal and say you know i'm the king of the tier threes and i can't help you and i'm not going to coach you and i'm not going to you know give you kind of a push in the right direction so we can go solve this together msps yeah. just don't have time for that type of person no absolutely you're spot on with that so these are people that got to this point the 25 percent that i'm saying have a nice day resumes look good resumes look legit they had everything that i needed from a tier one to a tier three but they just cannot get those three questions right. And I'm like, you know what? I don't care how smart you are. You're a jerk. We don't need you here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Love that. <laughs> um, and notice we have exit states for the, for our automation ticket. Yes. Uh, you know, they, they might not be a cultural fit at this point, or we might not have a position open for them at this point. Uh, sure. On this process, and I'm going to tell, go ahead and talk about the differences in what we do now and what we used to do. Typically, we would do a phone interview next. Uh, okay. That was especially effective five or six years ago. Uh, uh, in that case, Brooke would would uh, we would set the status for automation, phone interview requested, and ask them to uh, give us best times. Well, now we have Calendly. It gives them our Calendly link to book to book an interview. Wow. However, uh, so many of the vendors who sell personality profiles, aptitude tests, have these unlimited programs. Uh, our time is valuable. So we are now actually sending the personality profile test at this stage. It pretty okay. much says congratulations. You've made it to the next step. And Brooke, if you want to move them through our process, if you haven't already, uh, please take this personality profile. And guys, you are welcome to go ahead and fill that out. It doesn't cost us anything extra. If you want to take a personality profile, there are instructions in the email you should follow. Don't use your mobile phone and actually dedicate 30, 40 minutes of quiet time. Don't be interrupted. Uh, that test is hard. So we call it our, the, the status that we have, it's a candidate assessment because it measures the your aptitude and your ability to learn new skills. So it's not just, hey, this, really, this guy or girl is really good at teamwork or this person's more reserved and shy. It's a lot of different factors that go into the test. So I we actually stopped calling it a personality test within our system. We just called it a candidate assessment um, because that's what it is. It's assessing way more than just, you know, your, your color code or whatever. There's a lot of other factors. It, it measures your logical thinking and reasoning skills, your verbal uh, ability, uh, some numerical skills. So it's more than just the color stuff. That's and, fantastic. And as I mentioned before, it's, this is less often pass or fail. Okay. Uh, this is typically uh, informing you on how to ask questions during the interview. Uh, I want to add a side note. Aptitude test, personality test, there's a, a lot of stigma, and there's even some laws against using those for screening. Some states will say you may not rule somebody out based on an aptitude or personality test or either or, or both. Sure, sure. So if you're going to use one, do research with the company that you're going to use, uh, because a lot of them, the one that we have chosen, uh, they have several research studies and stuff to back it up uh, about why they ask the questions that they do. So make sure you're, you're researching the company that you're going to use carefully, that they've you know minded their P's and Q's uh, before you use them. And in our case, we try to use it again to inform us for the next step, which in our process, which is a little backwards of what's on here, it's the, it's the phone interview a.k.a. these days, the Zoom interview. Oh, there we go. <laughs> um, and to prepare for that call, uh, this is our this is the first time we're going to take a little deeper dive. And we're going to read things before the call. Brooke, I'll let you go through this list but every, on your prep for the Zoom call. Uh, <clears throat> I go through their resume once again just to make sure I'm good to go on that, to make sure that I look at their three questions. Um, I look at the uh, assessment that they've completed, make sure I, you know, any funky questions that I might need to ask. 
Um, I have uh, a list of probably 20 to 30 different questions that I asked throughout the interview. Um, technical questions are part of what I ask. Um, but if you've done well on the aptitude assessment, I know that you have the ability to learn quickly. I know that you have that aptitude. So right now I am looking more for your attitude. Um, do you have the attitude, that drive, that passion that I'm looking for, that this person's going to be a good fit? Um, I don't ask the questions in the same order every time. I try to be very conversational in the interviews. I highly recommend that because interviews are stressful. The person's already looking for a job. Doing an interview is, is very hard for them. I mean, sometimes I do five to seven a day. So, I mean, they're easy for me. But yeah. I will try to just, you know, talk to the person, you know, hey, how are you doing today? You know, this is how this is going to work. You know, let's talk about it. And, and I almost always ask, you know, let's walk through your resume and we'll start with the first job. Uh, but a, a person that I interviewed today, he was talking about his job. And I was like, man, that sounds really cool what they're doing there. And then so that kind of he was like, yeah, it's really great what they did here. Blah, blah, blah. He, it was COVID. So he got laid off. But if you can kind of get them more relaxed, uh, you're going to get more honest answers. You're going to really be able to see who that get that personality to open up if you can kind of get them to to let their guard down a little bit. Like I said interviews are so stressful anyway. Yeah, so, and we could we could probably spend four hours on this one slide uh, with the details of what to ask during a phone interview. Uh, <laughs> I think in a, some important things to point out, uh, Brooke, you are not very technical. Not anymore. You are, yet you are somehow able to eliminate those people who, who are BSing about the technical side. How is that? Um, I could just say we're really that good. I don't know <laughs> the answer, um, but I still work in the MSP space. I mean, I've been a service manager from a dispatcher to a VCIO to a tech, a tier one tech. I mean, so, I mean, I've done a lot of different things. Um, and the questions that we ask, you know, I ask about firewalls. I ask about virtualization tools, um, you know, projects they may have done, server migrations, O365. And I mean, I, I even though I work at Eureka Process, I'm still in the MSP space every single day. So if you try to give me some BS answer, then I'm really going to be on it. And now I'm really going to start asking some nasty hard questions. And then at that point, it's really just best for you to tell me, hey, I may have misspoke and let's just take a couple steps back. Because if you don't, then we're going to be done very quickly. Um, right. I had a guy that tried to tell me he had done a bunch of server migrations. And then I was like, well, how did you, you know, when you set up AD, did you do blah, blah, blah? And he was like, um, <laughs> you know what? I need to look at my notes. And I was like, okay. Yeah, the interview did not go well. So again, and nobody knows everything. And the questions that I asked, they yeah. run the gamut from, you know, PCs to servers to networking to whatever. And when I ask you the question, the best people are the ones that are say, you know, I can do this on this, but I mean, I can't prep the firewall. I can troubleshoot it and I can do this, but you know, I've never prepped the firewall out of the gate. So that I know what that person and they're confident in what they know and what they don't know. To me, that's something that's that really carries a lot of weight when you're doing an interview. And, and keep in mind on this first interview, this doesn't have to be your tier three interviewing a tier three tech. It doesn't have to be the owner. We have the benefit that we still have to pass it to our client for a final interview. So what we've done is we're recording this call. We're asking open-ended questions, letting them go. You know, Brooke knows enough to detect whether to dig in or not. Ultimately, the client gets to see the response and to yeah, see if it's right or not. That was my next question. How much of this information are you guys passing along? All of it. The All resume, of the only email if you interview. The person. Only if that person gets to where we're going to recommend it yeah, to the yes. client. Okay. Then they get everything. They'll get the resume. They get the assessment. They get the Zoom interview for, that we've recorded for them. I send them an email. It's kind of got my cliff notes about, you know, hey, this is what I really like about this person. This is where I think they're kind of light on it. And this is why I think they're going to be a good fit. And when I when I do the interview, I tell them, you know, if you get to the next step in the process, that that's the last step. That's the final interview. You're going to interview with X, Y, and Z. And there's going to be tier threes in there. And they're going to ask you more technical questions. So be prepared. So I set the expectation. But they only get all of these things if we recommend that person. And, right. And sometimes they check nine out of ten boxes. And we try to convince the client, look, uh, we think you'll agree. We've checked nine of these boxes. So don't waste your time on those nine boxes. Sure. Go focus on that tenth box. If they have to have it, you have to see, see that they have it. Uh, and then I'll add uh, one awesome book read regarding hiring the ideal team player by Patrick Lencioni. Uh, okay. He adds the requirements, and I like these requirements for hiring better than making them core values. Hungry, humble, and smart. Hungry, think of it as drive. Humble, lack of ego. Uh, and smart really means 
people smart, not technical smart? Do they, do they get social cues? Can they work in your team environment? Uh, so that's a great book. And they also give you tips about how to check each of the three boxes, hungry, humble, smart, questions to ask. Uh, and they also talk about extended interview processes. So great book, Hungry, Humble, and Hungry, I'm sorry, The Ideal Team Player, Hungry, Humble, and Smart. Uh, I love that. And we are very short on time. I know. I was just going to say we're getting into the last, you know, few uh, minutes that we have together here. Is there anything else on your slides that you guys want to go over? Um, uh, I'll run through them in just 60 seconds. Uh, okay. Uh, obviously at the end of this, uh, Brooke mentioned she has notes. So even if you're doing this internally, you need to be taking some notes on how the interview went, what happened. Recordings are best in a Zoom world uh, to share with the rest of the team. So we do feel like those next or final interviews should be group settings. We were a, a 20 person company at one time uh, and we had at 1.5 people in the room to interview. The two owners, a manager, somebody aka brooke who we just really appreciated their opinion even though they weren't necessarily a boss uh had great insight to hiring uh and a technical person okay you've only got one chance to get this right spend the resources you need to spend especially if you have been super efficient through the rest of this process now is the time to put resources into this to make sure you hire right because hiring twice is way more expensive yes you want somebody in the room that gets the company culture. Um, you want somebody that's going to be able to see, is this person going to be a fit? Because even if they're super smart and everything else, if they're not going to mesh with the rest of the team, it, it's going to make it, you know, life is not going to be fun. <laughs> for so, anyone, it's going to be hard for that person. It's going to be hard for your team. So we will run you guys through the rest of the process. And I think you're going to end in a, uh, sorry, you didn't get the job email from us. <laughs> uh, so we'll keep running uh, your ticket in our system through it so you can get all the emails along the way. My last point is when you decide to hire, I make the offer over the phone first. Okay. If I have any objections, I want a chance to negotiate before it's just dismissed in writing. So yeah. if we get to a general agreement on the phone, then I send the written offer. Followed by a, an entire different webinar on employee onboarding. When we do the interview for our B-screening process, I ask the candidate when, during the interview, what is your what, what salary are you looking for? I'm telling them I'm not negotiating with them, but I need to know if they're in the ballpark. Even though I've advertised it, even though it's on the job description, during part of my interview process, I ask what kind of salary are you looking for? Um, so that that way I can let the, the owner or whoever I'm communicating with, this is kind of the ballpark this person's looking for. And I mean, I, in general, we all have a little bit of wiggle room, but I mean, mm -hmm. you know, if the guy's asking for 150 and our budget's 80, I mean, you know, you should have read the ad better because I mean, I'm not even <laughs> going to recommend that. I mean, I don't know, no matter, unless you're going to replace three people, which he's not, you know, I, I we definitely ask that question because like I said, we want to make sure the people that we send them are 100% good to go. Now, I know we're going to get this question, but for anybody who's watching live with us right now or might be watching later on, how can people sign up to have a call with you and find out if, you know, what you, you guys can help them with? You know, because as you see in the IT and MSP business owners group, there's lots of people asking about suggestions and lots of other things when it comes to hiring. Uh, probably the, the, the easiest resource is just the website, eurekaprocess.com. Um, we have our overall process for, for business coaching there, uh, but there is under services, a V screening, if, if that's your interest to, to learn more about that. Uh, all of these processes are actually documented at our paid membership site, the Eureka community.com. Okay. Um, uh, I am also, I mean, this webinar is recorded and it will be available as well. Uh, and if you want to ping us on IT and MSP BOG, feel free. Just, you know, at Brooke Lee or at Alan Edwards and we'll yeah. respond. If you want to go straight to the fun, you can go to EurekaProcess.com and we have a V screening uh, under our services. Uh, you can go there and you can set up a call and talk to me. If you're ready just to, you know, let's just make this happen, then you can go there and we just will talk for an hour and we'll figure out what we need to do and get a plan together. Yeah, I mean, one of the cool things about our services is, is we actually charge a flat rate uh, plus marketing cost. So we share marketing costs amongst all of our clients to minimize that. Uh, and 
the longer it takes, just like with your MSP model, the longer it takes since we charge a flat rate, the less money we're making. So we're incentivized to get this right the first time. It's possible to get you a higher. Love that. Love that. Well, um, I really appreciate Brooke and Alan having you guys on here today. Um, love this topic because like I said, when we first uh, started the webinar, we get this question so, so much in our program and we see MSPs, like I said, in the community that this seems to be something that is just very, very time consuming and you guys do all the heavy lifting. So it seems just like a no brainer. <laughs> It, just, it helps when you have somebody that's, that is in the MSP space because we know what it we I, I know what it takes to make it. I know what it takes for somebody to be successful in that space, and it's not for everybody. Um, and so we want to make sure that the people that we're you know submitting or people that you're hiring that we want them to be successful. So I want to make sure that you have candidates that we're setting up for success out of the gate. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you guys so much for your time uh, today. Really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to pop that link back up. So anybody who is interested, be sure to head to eurekaprocess.com. Um, you know, feel free to reach out to Alan or Brooke in the IT and MSP business owners group as well. Um, but with that, I will wish you guys a fantastic rest of your day and looking forward to seeing you guys again really soon. Thank you so much, Lisa. Uh, Appreciate it. Bye, yeah. guys. Thanks, guys. Bye.